open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 and 2, I want to talk briefly about what I refer to as a balanced pulpit, a balanced pulpit, balanced preaching. You know, people use these words sometimes uh, without understanding the biblical context, the uh, we like to say he has to be balanced, or that wasn't balanced. Well, your idea of what balance, what a good balance is, and my idea, they're irrelevant. What 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 does the Bible consider to be a right balance when it comes to preaching? Uh, you know, it says in Isaiah, "My ways not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts." It's sometimes it's hard for us to think in those terms. It, the Lord doesn't look at things the way we do. Our understanding of things, of fairness and what is uh, right or wrong, uh, they're skewed by sin and by personal bias. And you got to go to the Bible. Uh, you, without going and finding out what God has to say about something, you just you talk like a fool. I mean, your opinion might be important to you, and other people might admire you and think you're learned and whatever, but if it doesn't... Let me give you an idea. Balance, we think in terms of 50-50. He's balanced. Now, when it comes to preaching, God has a different standard of what what, what a, a, a balance should be. Uh, starting in the first verse in chapter 4, 2 Timothy, this is Paul giving his charge to his ministerial young man. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Those are two judgments there, by the way. And uh, he says in verse 2, preach the word. Preach it. Don't preach yourself. Preach the word. To, and, and go easy on the stories. I mean, illustrations are necessary, uh, and, and, they, and they make for good sermons if they're properly, if they're spaced right and not overdone. But preach the word. Uh, be instant in season and out of season, when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. You say, why would you have to say that? Because <laughs> the flesh is the flesh is the flesh. And there's lots of times a preacher's going to get up on a Sunday morning and he's just not going to be all with it. Uh, he just doesn't feel like uh, whatever, the way he thinks he needs to feel on a Sunday to properly project uh, God's words. But you do it. Because you're called to do it, if you're a preacher. Now he says here, the three things here in verse 2. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Three things. Now, two of them are negative. One is positive. So the balance here is two-thirds on the negative side. And that's found in the uh, reproving and rebuking. An exhortation I consider to be positive, a necessary thing for preachers. Now, what's a a reproof? It's a warning. You know, straighten out or you're going the wrong way or things are not right. It's a warning. It it could be a, a gentle warning. It could be a stern warning. It's a reproof. It's a warning and it's needful. Uh, I remember just some while ago we had on Sunday morning and, and then Sunday evening a, a, a wonderful balance. Uh, Pastor Donovan at the Bible Baptist Church had in the morning uh, a message on uh, the judgment seat of Christ, a real warning, and it was excellent. And that night there was an exhortation uh, to press ahead, and it was a perfect balance there that, that particular day of reproving and then exhortation. And... Uh, doesn't happen every Sunday that way, but the Spirit of God knows what the congregation needs to hear. Not necessarily what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And he has to work through the preacher, and the preachers are all, in many cases, not submissive to what God, the Holy Spirit, wants said. Now you say, why should that be with God's ministers? Well, because God's ministers are flesh like anybody else, and they're they're prone to certain restrictions or constrictions. They're constrained sometimes. They have people there in the pulpit, believe it or not, that they might be afraid 
they might be afraid these people might get offended, uh, dear friends or whatever, and not come back. Or they, they, they're they're constrained by that. They, you know, when I used to preach, and uh, I went out to Texas many times to preach uh, a number of years ago, and I kept saying, "Do I have liberty? Do I have liberty?" Because there's things I believe the Lord wants me to say. I want to be able to feel free in saying them. Am I constrained in any way here? Is there anybody that's uh, uh, got a mindset about what preaching should be and should not be? Because I might, <laughs> I might blur those lines in that person's mind. And, and I, I want to know that the Spirit of God can move me in certain ways and I can say things that will give them food for thought, uh, maybe encourage them, maybe terrorize them. I don't know. And it's important. Same thing uh, by me speaking on the Final Fight Bible Radio, and I thank God uh, Brother Matt Crane was uh, very understanding in that regard. Do I have liberty? Can I say the things that I believe God moves me to say? I'm not always going to be on target. I understand that. I'm flesh, and I have my own uh, sets of biases formed over the years by experience and contacts and dealings with people. Uh, but I want to be true to what God shows me, and I don't want to hold back. I do not want to have regrets at the judgment seat of Christ, and I wasn't plain enough, clear enough, or I held back for the sake of sparing someone's feelings. All right, If you've listened to me for, for a while or whatever, you know I'm the offensive Christian. I'm liable to offend, and I have no problem with that. I'm not going to go home and wring my hands over it. Oh, did anybody get upset? Uh, if you're prone to getting upset over things that are said plainly and bother you, what can I say? You know, grow up. So what you have today, unfortunately, in many pulpits is a, a, a lady will see in nursery for children where preachers are afraid to get somebody upset. They, they want to be liked. There's that human, I, do you like me? I, you know, I mentioned before we had Ed Koch as mayor in New York for 12 years. He went around saying, how am I doing? How am I doing? Listen, if you've got to keep asking people how you're doing, there's something wrong, you know? If you know you're doing right and you're doing what a mayor should do and you're making the tough decisions, you don't have to go around saying, how am I doing? But a politician really has to be sensitive to that. Because the first duty of a politician is to get himself or herself reelected. But that's not the case with a preacher. <laughs> He's not running for office. He's not taking a public opinion poll. He's there to deliver faithfully what God wants him to say. So there's three things here. And I mentioned reproving. Now, rebuking is a little different. Rebuking is, uh, it's more than just a warning it's you get read out you get the riot act in some cases uh put to you a rebuke is sharp a rebuke is hey i'm not just warning you i'm telling you straighten out or else you're rebuking somebody i'm talking about believers the uh, paul was very clear on that when he dealt with the corinthian church and he was told that there was somebody there that was uh fornicating and uh, he said that he was going to turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That's powerful. That's powerful. But he told those Corinthians, I, I, they should have done it already. In other words, they should have gotten him out of there. Uh, they should have removed him. But he said, you're puffed up. Meaning, it, these are the people who kept saying, we love you, we love you, God loves you, we love you. And they had so much love that they allowed him to stay there in his sin. And you know the saying, a bad apple can poison a whole barrel. They allowed him to sit there knowing <coughs> knowing his, his sin and didn't act. And that's why Paul got upset. He said, you're puffed up. You're puffed up with this, you know, we have so much love here. We're not going to come down hard on our brother. We're, we're just going to love him back to the Lord. How's that? Are you kidding? So I could just imagine this tough old Jew, Paul, looking looking at these Corinthian Christians and saying, forget about it, it doesn't work that way. Get him out of there, or I'll turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Now, we got many pastors today who don't believe in that. You see, they don't uh, believe in shunning or whatever. They uh, allow Christians who are in rebellion to sit there and uh, remain uh, pretty much comfortable. Uh, and that's what I call the, the, the Laodicean mindset. 
that has crept into the pulpits. You know, does everybody like me? Am I doing a good job? Will you come back next week? If I don't offend anybody, will you keep coming and put the money in the basket so I can keep eating and all of that? I never was uh, affected by that fear, thank God, when I passed it in Brooklyn for 15, 16 years. I had my own job. I had my own income, and I was basically able to be sustained that way. If you didn't come, if you didn't like the preaching, too bad. Uh, whether you put money in it or not, or you left, that was, I wasn't going to lose any sleep over it one way or another. All I knew is I had people there that I believed really needed to hear the truth, and they were going to hear it. And uh, thank God it had the right effect. Now, the last one is exhortation, which we all need. We grow weary in the way. We grow weary. We need to be encouraged. And exhortation, oh, it's like a cold glass of water on a hot day. It's, it's refreshing. It's the Lord telling you, I'm with you. I'm behind you. Don't be afraid. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's an exhortation. Go on. Press ahead. You're near the end now. Keep going. I had uh, years ago uh, embraced Acts twenty twenty four as a verse uh, to guide my life, but none of these things moved me, Paul said, uh, meaning he was just told that troubles were going to come, and he was saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, and they were crying because he was on his way to Jerusalem, and, and they, they knew, according to the prophecy there, they were getting that he was going to have trouble there, and things weren't going to go well. And they also knew that they weren't going to see his face anymore because he told them. And uh, it was a sad occasion. But he said, none of these things move me. I, I got to keep going. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. In other words, if I lose, lose my life for the cause of Christ, so what? That's why I enlisted as a soldier for Jesus Christ. And none of these things move me. Neither I... I Count I my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy. There's a difference there. Some finish their course without joy, with a lot of grief and sadness. That I may finish my course with joy and the ministry that I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He just wanted to finish the race standing up and not falling down at the finish line. It's a beautiful picture of Paul saying, I'm going on, I'm going on, no matter what, I'm going on. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people in church that are far from being disciples. They sit there, they remain in sin and rebellion. In many cases, they're in a church where they're not afraid where the preacher's going to get on their case, and they're comfortable, and they don't move one way or another, and they stay there week in and week out, month in and and there's no real movement. And many of these congregations, small or large, in my opinion, just perpetuate babe, uh, the, the child, uh, childhood. These are Christians that will never grow up, never grow up. Sometimes they got to be shook up hard. You know, there's a, a movie that left an impression on me years ago. I don't even think I was saved when I first saw it. It was called the DI, which is Drill Instructor. And uh, it, it, it had the uh, guy that played dra Dragnet, Jack Webb, was the star of that. It was about young men that had been drafted into the Marines, and they were in boot camp. And he was the drill instructor. And, oh, boy, what, what he had to do to get these boys to become men, men that could go into combat. And the things that he said to them, he broke them down. He broke them down so that they would be good and effective as a combat unit. You know, we're living in a time because of this Laodicean mindset, the pastors are unwilling to do that kind of work. I call that roto rooter work. Sometimes you got to get in there and be very plain and say, listen, this has to be straightened out. This has to be corrected. But no, no, to turn on Christian radio and TV, for the most part, it's a joke. It's really, it's all about you, your relations, how you feel today. You okay? I'm glad you're feeling good. God just loves you. He cares so much about you. He's so happy that you're saved and you're here at church. Oh, oh, oh. la di da di da Hold hands and let's sing Kumbaya and we'll all feel better. I mean, give me a break. What is this? That's what Christian babies are going to stay babies forever under that kind of preaching. They're never going to grow. They're never going to grow. You've got to use the sword. You've got to use the sword. I'm going to just refer you briefly to a note, uh, Dr. Ruckman. If you have a Ruckman reference Bible, 
You ought to look at this note. It's uh, what he says here on the uh, in Romans. It's Romans 7.24. If you turn to that for a second. Romans 7.24 in the Ruckman Reference Bible. Boy, some of these notes, they, they, really, they really hit home. I so much appreciate this labor that Dr. Ruckman left us. On that verse, it says in chapter 7 of Romans, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's Paul talking about himself. Imagine that. O wretched man that I am. Paul comes right out and tells the Romans, hey, I got a problem. There's something wrong with me. And he, before he describes the, the tug of war between the spirit and the flesh. But you think pastors are going to address their congregations that way? Ye who are evil know how to give good things to your children. You know, and here's Ruckman's note on that, 724. It says, for example, Louis the Fourteenth, that's the king of France, said to a Huguenot preacher, Huguenots were French Protestants that were very much persecuted by Catholics, he said, for example, Louis, King Louis said, I've heard many great sermons, and I've been highly pleased with them. But whenever I hear you, I go away displeased with myself. Well, amen. Sounds like you got a preacher there. Bob Jones Sr. said, if a preacher doesn't make you feel mean, he is no good. Now, now think about this. Think because this is opposite the way we think or the way we feel. That's why he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. On a regular basis, two out of every three times, you should be getting stuff from the pulpit that makes you feel like a rotten, low-down snake still fooling around with sin or living in rebellion with a need to get right. We lack holiness. We lack holiness. And we don't want to obey. Children don't want to obey. That's the way children are. Now the preaching has to do something about that. Has to somehow turn that around. Change people. But more often than not, it doesn't. Why? Well, we just have, want people to have a good experience. And they look forward to coming to church. And we have a lot of fellowship. And who smiles and who sings and who this and who that. Brothers and sisters, this is pathetic, and it's only going to get worse. But I'm, I'm addressing the ministers here. I'm addressing those men that go into the pulpit. Are you ready to preach the way God wants you to preach? Now, there's a difference between preaching and teaching, and I'm going to say very plainly, some men could be excellent Bible teachers, very good, skillful, and gifted. But preaching? Not so. And some men could be very good preachers. And as Bible teachers, very sad. Very sad. In need of much improvement. Now that's the way it is. And that's what I've experienced over the years of I've heard and listened to. And I've heard quite a few. And if a man like Bob Jones said, if he doesn't make you feel miserable because you're coming to church in your sins. Okay, you, st you have sin. You have issues. You have problems with the Lord. There's contention there that has to be dealt with. And there are times you need to be encouraged and exhorted. I understand that. Now, that's balance in the pulpit. Some are not going to like what I said. Too bad. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts, please, the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 15, and I'd like you to begin with verse 36. Now, this is a sad story, but uh, this is life. What happens here between Paul and Barnabas is what you would call a very difficult parting. And there's a, there's a lot behind the scenes here that I, I want to explain. Uh, first of all, Paul and Barnabas, who had been traveling together, were now in Antioch. And uh, this was before they were going to start their second missionary uh, journey. And what happens here is, uh, back in verse 31, we're told, uh, 32, we're told that Silas was also there. And then in verse 34 in Antioch, it says, Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. It, now, the reason I pointed that out is because the Lord is never taken by surprise. He knew exactly what was coming, okay? 
and he had his contingency plan in operation. And that meant Silas being set aside because something was going to happen with the Paul Barnabas team. Now, Barnabas was the uncle to John Mark. And Barnabas' sister Mary had a, looks like a house church in Jerusalem there. That's that house where they were praying when Peter got locked up and they were praying for his deliverance and uh, they, they <laughs> wound up getting their prayer answered, much to their shock. Uh, so they, I, I want to bring out the fact that there's a family connection here so you could look behind the scenes a little bit of what's really going to happen. What happens here in verse 36 And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now watch that. Determined. He might have already had an inkling that Paul was disgusted with John Mark because John Mark quit on them at Pamphylia. He quit. He left them. And uh, and, and obviously, Paul was not inclined to bring them along. So I think Barnabas knew that. And in verse 37, it says he was determined. Now, that tells you there can't be a rapprochement here between Barnabas and Paul. This is going to lead to a bitter contention. And this happens in Baptist churches. Believe me, you you ought to know this. This is not uncommon at all. Headstrong, determined, no, it's got to be this way. No, he wants it that way. And you have a split. Okay? And it happens. It's human nature. You have a split. Baptists are very passionate about what they believe. Amen. As far as doctrine is concerned anyway. Very passionate. And, uh, And in church practice and other things. But... When they clash, when you have two Baptist men with very strong convictions about certain things, and there's, and there's a discrepancy there, and they clash, it probably could lead to a split. Okay? There's, uh, and you say, well, it, it, don't you have to take your stand, Brother Militello? Yes, especially on doctrine. Doctrine first, absolutely. You can't compromise doctrine. Sound doctrine is sound doctrine, Period. But on other things, I, I, I'd say, listen, the scripture says, be as wise as serpents, as harmless as doves. Exercise a little wisdom and try and get an idea of where this is going to lead to, this argument, this um, clash of views. Where is it going to lead to? Uh, if you think about that a little, a little bit, you might hold back. You know, we sometimes enjoy our passion and zeal. That could be dangerous. Passion and zeal are necessary, and, and, and it, it, there's a place for it. But be careful. You know, don't enjoy it too much. Don't get overzealous or overpassionate. You're liable to talk like a fool and do damage that, that can't be undone. Listen, once stuff comes out of your mouth from off your tongue, it's out there. You can't call it back, okay? It's out there, and it's going to do what it's going to do. So be careful. Now, here's the deal. Paul, being a business-oriented Jew, okay, just like the Lord Jesus Christ, I must be about my father's business when he told his mother and Joseph when they found him. You got Paul with the very same mentality. All business-minded. Let's get the business done. God's business, period. Now, this is a perfect example here when Christians tell me, uh, well, uh, our God is a merciful God, and I believe in a God of second and third and fourth chances, I'd say, well, that's nice. But biblically, (laughs) there's no guarantee. God is not obligated to give anybody a second chance, okay? You quit on him, he's liable to just put you on a shelf and leave you there. So I, I don't know where this comes from. Well, we, we, we want to dwell on the mercy and the goodness and the forgiveness of God. Amen. But that doesn't put him under obligation uh, to lift you up and get you back in the race. He sees what he sees. Now, Paul at this point could not be convinced by Barnabas that John Mark was going to be fine. He was going to work out. 
Paul is only thinking, look, he quit on us again. I don't want this. He quit on us before. I don't want him quitting on us again. It's a problem. I, right now, I'm not comfortable with him coming. I, I just don't want to take the risk. Barnabas, who I believe had gotten pressure from his sister, remember Mary with the house church? Might have had his sister prevail on him and say, listen, my boy John Mark is a good boy. He's a really good boy. And after all, uh, things happen. He was, uh, the missionary journey was tough. He didn't know what to expect. So he fell, he quit. But you got to give him another chance. He's a good boy. He's my son. Now, Barnabas, <laughs> being the brother, probably looked at his sister. See, this is, brothers and sisters, this is where family attachments can really get you in trouble. <laughs> And Baptists ought to know about this because many of these Baptist churches are nothing but family cliques and friends. <laughs> Some of them are just ridiculous. They're nothing but a social club, okay? But this is a big problem down south with families and family attachments. And I've, I've done lessons on this before about family and putting the created above the creator. You get in trouble. You get in trouble, but I mean, what brother doesn't want to uh, wants to see his sister crying? And he probably loved his nephew, and he figured, well, my nephew ran into some uh, problems, and you know, it happens. He was a rookie, and he went home. But listen, Paul was determined. He was looking at this strictly from a business point of view, not a personal point of view or a family thing. Okay, and I, I got to tell you, I go along with Paul. God's business has to be done that way. You got to put aside sentimentality or else you're going to be reluctant to use that knife, which is the sword of the Lord, the word of God. And sometimes maybe you have to use it like a hammer. My word is like a hammer breaketh into pieces on loved ones, family members, close associates. Now, if you draw back, well, you're just a little bit too sentimental, okay? And you're putting your feelings for that person above what God wants to do. I think I told you that situation once. Uh, I'll tell you again. My, I was working on my uncle on my wife's side and uh, really getting him with the scriptures, and he was under conviction, lost Catholic. And I was dealing with him, and my mother-in-law was getting real nervous because she was witnessing the whole thing. And she wanted to protect her brother because she saw the brother was getting a little nervous. Uh, and she more or less told me, no, uh, listen, he, he's okay, my brother. Yeah, leave it alone. Uh, let the Lord do it. I think I told you that. Let, let the Lord convince him or whatever. Well, she completely threw a, a cold water on the entire uh, interaction that was going on between me and her brother. And there was some real heavy interaction going on. The devil was anxious to break this thing up. And who did he find? My mother-in-law, the sentimental woman caring about her brother's feelings. Oh boy, have I gone through this enough times, all right? So I waited. I didn't want to embarrass her. I waited. Uncle Mike went home and I grabbed my mother-in-law. I says, mom, when you say, let the Lord do it, don't you realize Jesus Christ is in us he speaks through us when we allow him, when we're filled with the Spirit. He wants to get something done or something said that's important. You came along, and while that fire was ready to rage, you came along with a tub of cold water and put it out. You put it out. You were sincere. You meant well. And you were filled with the devil. Well, what do you mean? I said, Mom, listen, when somebody says, let the Lord do it, they're copping out. They're trying to mask their fear or their cowardice. That's all they're doing. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing to be ashamed about. You say, well, we run the risk of you know, hurting his feelings. He won't come back or whatever. Hey, listen, better he should hear the truth and get saved and avoid hell than worry about his feelings, okay? Uh, and this situation is, is not unique to me. I'm sure uh, other Christians that, that really work at trying to get people under conviction and save experience the same thing. And it's getting worse in the church. And, and God's people are just squeamish. 
squeamish. They don't want to take that sword and do some cutting. They think they'll pray over the poor person and that tumor of sin and self-righteousness will somehow disappear like the, the Pentecostals. When I they go, well, Brother Miller, tell her we got a healing service going on and everything. I says, yeah, I know all about it. All these mysterious healings with some growth vanishing and disappearing and everything and nobody could prove anything. I says, this is a joke. Get out of here with that stuff. But this is what you have. So Paul says no. And what happened? Verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Now, this next verse is real life, folks. The Bible doesn't cover this stuff up. And this is in the New Testament, and Paul is filled with grace, and Barnabas is filled with grace, and they're spirit-filled men and all of that. And yet, look what happens. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Okay, Paul, you don't want my nephew, I'll take him. We'll become a team. Now the Lord knew what was going to happen, and he had Silas waiting in the wings. Okay, Silas, you move in, Barnabas is out. Oh, by the way, I'm glad Bar Barnabas loved his nephew. He helped his nephew get back on track because later on, John Mark gets straightened out and he becomes profitable for the ministry. You could check that out in Colossians 4.10. Other it, it, it's apparent that Barnabas saw something in his nephew, didn't give up on him. Well, good for Barnabas, but look at it from Paul's point of view. At this particular moment, he was not ready to get John Mark with him again. Now, Silas was obviously ready because what happens after this is you've got the conversion of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. You've got that revival, that midnight revival going on in the jail. Great things start to happen with that new combination of Paul and Silas. And look at the rest of the book of Acts. Don't see much about Barnabas, do you? So who was right in this thing? Okay. Think about that. You know, when a Christian insists on getting their way and they believe themselves to be right, and the Lord lets them have their way, they sometimes find out later on, I lost something along the way. It's like the Jews that clamored for flesh when they were in the wilderness. They lusted for flesh. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to give them all they can handle. And he sent over a flock of quail. And they stuffed themselves, gorged themselves, probably got sick on it. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't have porta potties then, so it must have been a real scene <laughs> where these people went to relieve themselves. I, I mean, you know, you fill up with the meat all day, all day, and it's going to have a, a reaction. <laughs> but what happened was the Lord said he gave them, you know, their desire, but with it sent leanness of soul. In other words, yeah, I'll give you what you want, but you're going to be a little sorry you got it, okay? So this is a sad thing here that happens in the book of Acts. But oh boy, what a thing we have here in this Bible. The Lord just lays it all out for us and shows us. He said, you've had contention, you've had a parting of the ways with various brothers or sisters. Yeah, well, welcome to the club. What could I tell you? Hang around long enough and you might have some more. <laughs> the good thing is, the Lord is over all, okay? He's over all. And thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thank God. Okay. God bless you. Amen.